of you have heard of NREX? Just any idea? Three. Okay, so let me ask the other question. How many of you have seen traffic data in a car on a mobile device across the road? Uh, heard it on TV or radio, seen it on the Weather Channel? Okay, so chances are you've seen our data and you didn't know it was R. We're the guys who power traffic data for most of the applications in the world. This includes uh, every single Samsung phone. It includes BMW, Ford, Tesla, Audi, most of the car OEMs. It includes folks like the Weather Channel, Clear Channel Communications, uh, as well as numerous mobile apps uh, and a variety of other things. What I want to talk about is uh, how this data relates to kind of the Internet of Things. You know, we started this business 10 years ago with a simple idea, and that was let's collect data from vehicles and devices out on the road, which in 2015 sounds pretty obvious, but in 2004, there was no such thing as a connected car. There was no such thing as an iPhone. There was no such thing as an iPad. There was no such thing as Google Android, right? But we thought that as more and more vehicles became connected, you could actually start getting interesting data from these vehicles and start to create some pretty interesting things. So what we do is collect massive amounts of data, literally more than a petabyte of data every single day from vehicles and devices, mobile devices out on the road that we then process and we use that to create a set of applications and information for both consumers as well as for smart cities. And it's that integration that we feel is pretty powerful of the two. So think of this as the internet of the automobile. Well, I grew up in Detroit, and I can tell you with some level of experience that the car for 100 years didn't really fundamentally change. The last car company to go public was the Ford Motor Company, which went public literally way before any of us were born. Right? That was up until very recently, of course, when Tesla went public. Right? For 100 years, cars were basically four wheels, a drivetrain, an engine, and some sheet metal. Now it's completely changed. The car is now a mobile computing platform. It has Ethernet, it has a vehicle bus, it has, in the average luxury car today, more than 100 sensors that are collecting real-time information that are then put onto a data bus that are then accessible from the vehicle itself. And what we do is pull that information off of those vehicles in real time and then create services around that. So imagine a world where there's more than 250 million vehicles and devices transmitting information all the time. Location, speed, heading direction, airbag status, traction control, temperature, all of that thing. And think about the kind of world you can create and the kind of information you can create based on that data. Right? That's not some far-flung future. That exists today. If you look out this window right here, one, more than one out of every two commercial vehicles Taxi cabs, limos, Uber vehicles, uh, long haul trucks, one out of every two is transmitting data in real time. In the United States, 25% of all cars that shipped last year have embedded cellular connections and are transmitting data in real time. Most people don't know that, but that creates a wealth of information that you can actually do some very, very interesting things with. So let's talk about what you can do with that. Right? So the most obvious thing, which is where we started our business, was around being able to create traffic information literally everywhere. Now to put this in perspective, state of the art when we started this business to collect traffic data was quite literally businesses flying helicopters and people looking out the window to figure out what was going on. That was state of the art in terms of traffic data collection 10 years ago. Right now, there are no traffic helicopters flying in this country anymore. The companies that did that are now out of business. Right? Then government put half a billion dollars of your money, taxpayer money, half a billion dollars to instrument sensors on 5,000 miles of road. Well, that sounds pretty good. Now we can start to get data on what's going on. 5,000 miles of road, half a billion. OK, we took $30 million of private venture capital and now provide data on more than 2 million miles of road in the United States. So orders of magnitude less cost and orders of magnitude more coverage. And this is what you see today. If you pull up a map on, like you said, a mobile app or a website or something like that, you'll see, for instance, in Boston, almost every single road in Boston, whether it's a freeway or an arterial or a side street, where we have data moving around, we can provide that kind of real-time information that you expect. 
and you use that every day. And that obviously helps people figure out what's the fastest way to get to the airport. If I'm Uber, what's the fastest way for me to do a pickup? If I'm UPS, how do I need to do my deliveries today so that my driver can be done in the shortest amount of time? Okay, but now let's take it a step further. What if you could get temperature, traction control, fog light status, windshield wiper status in real time from all these vehicles? Well, now you can do some interesting things, and I can alert people and say, hey, a mile ahead, somebody just slipped on the ice, or somebody's car is hydroplaning because of the rain. You need to slow down. Right? In an autonomous vehicle scenario, I can slow that vehicle down if it's going too fast coming into an icy patch on the road. Right? Vehicles that are getting real-time crowdsourced traffic data, the vast majority of vehicles now shipping with connected devices. Ford Sync, BMW iDrive, Audi Connect, Tesla, broad variety of others, that already exists. The real-time safety alerts already exists or will exist uh, for most vehicles by the end of this year. But now let's go a step further. Most vehicles now are starting to have what are called LiDAR sensors and cameras to do things like self-parking. You've probably all seen the commercials now where many vehicles have enough cameras and sensors, you push a button, you get out of the car, and it figures out how to park itself, right? That does it by looking at basically LiDAR, radar type sensors that are basically looking at data uh, to figure out where vehicles are. Well, what if those sensors, as you're driving down a road, are looking at the parking spots and can tell you where the open parking spots are and transmit that to the cloud. And now I can tell people where exactly the open spots are around Beacon Hill where they're trying to park. Those services will exist in less than a year in production vehicles on the road. Right? That's another example of the car becoming basically an internet enabled device, all these sensors, and then creating useful experiences. Now, why is that important? It's important because, of course, traffic is one of society's greatest problems. It causes pollution, it causes carbon emissions, it causes a loss of productivity. And parking, most people don't know, but about 30% of the traffic in most urban cities is due to parking. People tra driving around trying to find parking. So if you can solve those two things, you can have a very big impact on society as a whole. A bunch of other information is now being delivered to the car. What if I could tell you at the breakfast table that you don't have enough gas to get to work today, so you need to leave early? Okay? Those type of scenarios, again, are what car companies are working on today. What if I could tell you as you're driving to work, you're going to be 10 minutes late? So should I email the people in your first meeting that you're going to be late? Right? Basically taking information from your mobile phone, about your contacts and your calendar, integrating that with the car to allow you to just say yes. As opposed to sitting there and text and causing driving distraction, the car knows you're going to be late and says, do you want me to text the first people in your meeting? And you say yes, and it's done. Right? That kind of integration, again, is what's happening today. And you're seeing it being led by folks like Tesla and Audi and BMW, the folks who are kind of on the forefront of this innovation. Again, this is the investment that's happening today. But that's only half the equation, right? If we can give people better information in the car, they'll make better decisions, which means you'll reduce traffic. But it doesn't solve the problem because you have to look at this from a macro point of view in addition to a micro view. So the other half the equation is not only collecting data and providing drivers better information, but providing government better information. So more than 60 different government agencies today use this data to help optimize their road networks. The picture that you see here, this is actually the New Jersey Department of Transportation. This is their operations center. There's about 50 people who work in the operations center. And their job is to basically optimize traffic flow, as well as deal with things like hurricanes and snowstorms and floods and things like that. But what you'll see front and center is this is real-time crowdsourced information that they're collecting, that we provide them, that they're using to manage their road networks. When they detect that there's an accident somewhere, they can send out incident response trucks and tow trucks to deal with it very quickly. When they detect that you know, a certain bridge is backing up, they can actually change traffic signal timing on the road to optimize people going a different way. Right? So now you see governments who started out trying to figure out what's happening on the road. Then they started using this data to make investment decisions. 
Right? The greatest thing that I think you know, uh, has happened in the last 10 years is you've no longer seen these bridge to nowhere projects. It used to be your senator or your congressman was the one who was responsible for figuring out where to make investments based on what he thought was important to his district. Well, now if you have hard data on here's the 10 worst hotspots in the United States, it's very hard for a congressman to argue you need to invest in number 67 when you're not funding projects 1 through 10. So that's one of the key things that, you know, uh, obviously we can help, as well as the real-time management. But it goes a step further. Right now, this is getting into population movement and population analytics. What you're seeing here, this is real-time data. Um, and this is Internet of, of Things in Action. This is real-time data collected from mobile phones as well as from cars about population movement. And this is actually done over New Year's Eve in London. And what you're seeing is, this is New Year's Eve, uh, New Year's Eve night. And what you see is the buildup in the financial district as people are moving into the financial district and going to work. And you see the population buildup start to shift. Here we are at midday around noon. The population pattern moves. This is a big shopping day in London. People go to the West End, do their shopping, hang out, have lunch, and things like that. But what you're seeing now is population moving into Trafalgar Square. Trafalgar Square is where there's a lot of concerts and events coming into basically the New Year's Eve celebration in London. And then as we come into New Year's Eve, what you'll see is on the Thames River, the population build up as people move to the river to look at the fireworks celebration happening over the London Bridge. And then as we hit New Year's Eve, you'll see the max population, and now it starts to diffuse, and you'll see the mass transit locations, the subway stations and things like that, the bus stations, where people are going to basically now get out of the city before the end of the day. This is not a simulation. This is real-time data. What we're doing is we're basically anonymously tracking cell phone pings to towers. So as you walk around with your cell phone, it's pinging a tower. We collect that data and then use that to provide data about where population movements are happening. And that's obviously useful not only for governments to manage their mass transit and things like that, but it's also useful for advertisers to know how many people are looking at billboards. It's useful for retailers to know how many people are expected to be in their area. It's useful for a whole bunch of different reasons. So let me wrap up. A lot of people talk about you know, all these different scenarios. If you read the magazines about Internet of Things, you know, I want to drive my car into my garage and my, my thermostat automatically turns on. Right? Well, that's kind of a cute scenario. Right? But what we're talking about here goes much deeper than that. What we're talking about is literally saving people's lives. The North Carolina Department of Transportation got up on stage at a conference about six months ago, and they brought a truck driver with them. And he said, you know, we were in a jackknife my semi-truck in the middle of nowhere. I was pinned into my vehicle. It was up in the hills. Nobody knew this was happening. But the New Jersey or New North Carolina Department of Transportation was able to detect what happened on that vehicle by data coming off the vehicle. The airbag had been deployed. We knew that there was traffic starting to back up. They sent out an incident response truck, and that truck driver credited this system with saving their lives. So what we're talking about is not so much the, the cutesy scenarios, but we're talking about solving one of society's biggest problems and saving lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why I think this internet of vehicles and what's happening on the road is quite compelling.